Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Tata Steel 2023. It's our first Elite Chess Tournament of the calendar year. And throughout this event, we've had the same thing that we've been paying attention to over and over again. Will Magnus Carlsen stop the slump? He lost two games in a row for the first time in eight years. And that's really all he needed. It was like an anime moment where the protagonist goes down and it looks like it's all over. But good God... What have we started? This is the round 10 recap of 13. The tournament is nearly at its conclusion. And uh, as always today, I've got a handful of games. I will start with the Magnus game uh, because, you know, uh, sometimes I put it at the end, sometimes at the beginning. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm going to give you what you want. But I have kept up a theme during these recaps. And the recaps have all had spectacular games. Today's games were epic. All right. Um, so Magnus is playing with the black pieces against Parham Maksudlu, a uh, very strong uh, grandmaster from Iran, the highest rated chess player in Iran. Magnus plays a queen's gambit decline, but it is very rare to play d4, d5 nowadays. And the reason for that is that mostly grandmasters use this move order so that they can go knight c3 and then play a nimso Indian instead. Because normally against d5, in this position, there is pawn takes, and this like is called the exchange variation of the queen's gambit declined, uh, and it's considered to maybe be slightly better for white. Tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Oh. Now, Magnus wanted that. Um, it's, it's not that Parham fell into a trap, but rather Magnus is going to surprise Parham. And Magnus is at his best when he plays these really obscure lines. So Magnus develops his bishop, and generally gameplay here goes c6 and castle and knight bd7. Yeah, Magnus throws in the move h6, which on its own isn't some groundbreaking concept. The bishop slides back, and now once again, play usually develops via castle, c6, and so on. Now, there have literally been millions of games played in this position. At the master level, it's something like hundreds of thousands, okay? And as I said, play is this and this. That is just what black does, all right? There's not really a whole lot else black can do. Because black can't really go here. The bishop needs to protect two different spots. Well, Magnus plays a move that has been played in less than point oh 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 oh. Like, the last time this was played was like eight year, 10 years ago in like a correspondence game, which is the master level of basically your daily chess games on chess.com. Um, he plays bishop g4. That's a weird move. It's a weird move because it attacks the queen, but it destabilizes the queen side. So you would think white's best move is just to play the very natural queen to b3 which would target this and this, and you would threaten bishop f6 and this. But apparently if black just plays knight bd7, white actually has no real threat. Because rook b8 and rook b2 and position is actually far more dangerous for white. So queen b3 is not going to cut it. Uh, Parham could, of course, play very solidly with bishop e2, just trading bishops. Parham also can consider f3 which very much is a move, by the way, because in a lot of these positions, white wants to put a bishop here, a knight here, and play e4, but probably Parham did not play f3 because he's like, well, Magnus probably prepared f3. So Parham definitely wanted to avoid Magnus's prep, so he gave him this check, which is most certainly a move, and the point is to get the queen out of danger, force black into blocking the check, and now just basically develop and argue that this is sort of pointless. Okay, and then Parham was like, really, Magnus, I have no idea what you're doing with your bishop. I mean, now you have to go back this way because you can't do this. I mean, if you do that, you're never going to make it to that square because I'm just going to go back and take and I'm going to go g4. So Parham plays h3 and he's like, all right, well, Magnus has to retreat his bishop on that diagonal because going to bishop h5 is stupid. So it must have been extremely peculiar when Magnus played bishop h5. <clears throat> now, normally you play that move because you can go there. And you will take with that pawn. But that pawn's not... So Parham goes queen c2. And now if Magnus makes one more slow move, I mean, g4 comes and Parham's just going to win a pawn. So what does Magnus do? c5. Oh boy. He is sacrificing a pawn. Straight up. Why is this a pawn sacrifice? Because if you play pawn takes c5, 
and black responds, bishop takes c5. Magnus uh, loses. He just loses. Queen f6, knight d5, and if pawn takes his kingside is horrible, g4 is coming, the game is over. Uh, bishop g6, and then, and then takes the bishop. So c5 is a is straight up like he's just giving Parham the pawn. Now Parham could take, and Magnus's idea was to sacrifice the pawn for something aggressive, but we have g4. Now we have takes, takes. And then you notice Parham didn't take the bishop. He didn't want his knight taken. And this, and queen takes g6. And this, this is craziness. I mean, Magnus is just straight up down a pawn, but he's got the game under control. He plays knight takes g4. Now the rook and the knight both hit f2. These two pieces stare down this way. It's a very complex position. Queen e6 check, hg, bishop h4, knight f3 attacks the bishop on h4. This is under fire. Rook e7 would win a queen if it wasn't illegal. Uh, and now we have this. And knight takes d5. And Parham Maksudlu is just straight up, up a pawn against Magnus Carls. Just up a pawn. No questions. Well, some questions, like the fact that black has a lot of activity. Rook e8 check, and now a very nice move by Magnus, uh, jumping directly into the white position and basically just asking, like, where are you going? You know? Like, like what are you going to do here? I got, I got my rook here in the center of the board, and Parham tries to shove his pawn out of the way, but now the knight comes to b4, and it really just feels like Magnus is just running circles around the white pieces. Just incredible control here. The knight comes in check. Can't take because I'm pinned. Parham trying to run away. Takes. Rook g4. One pawn has been captured back. And Parham just goes all in, giving up the pawn on b2 also. So Parham from one pawn up is now one pawn down. Now, if Parham's e pawn could jump here, he would be winning. For instance, this is a winning position for white. Join pawns. They're going to push. But the second you go to e4, of course, I'm going to take. So that blockade is so important for black. And Magnus just continues with rook b4. Rook d1. Now Magnus brings his king. Now the black king has arrived and the bishop dominates the knight. I mean, the knight just has no access forward. It also has no access backward because it can't cross the fourth rank. This knight is neutered. Knight d2, rook a4. And now Magnus plays rook a3 because that pawn's not actually defended. And masterclass here as the game goes to a rook end game with magnus up two pawns uh this is resignable here but parham actually just played it on uh he played it on for a while and magnus starts sending his b pawn it's a completely winning end game because the rook does what's called cutting off the king all right rook h6 white can never get close parham goes for this and we have an exchange of pawns but this is a very well-known winning endgame because the king is on the long side of the pawn. Short side defense is where you would have needed to defend, which essentially is here. But because the king is completely cut off on the long side of the board, uh, black just brings the king all the way down. He will get the king over here, push the pawn, and then he will escape by building the bridge, as they call it. So in this position, Parham resigned because... Uh, the king is now forced out. If it goes there, then king c1. And this is a very, very famous uh, building the bridge concept where your king and rook build the bridge for the king's escape. King c2, check. King b3, check. King c3, check. King b4, check. And rook b5. Your king dances out onto the bridge and rook b5 blocks. Build the bridge. And Magnus has won three out of his last four games. He is now one point away from first. This man was like third from bottom. And uh, that's what happens. You wake up the goat. You better not, you know, you better not miss. Uh, this next game I have for you, I'm going to call this the Hunger Games. All right, we're going to go through this game quickly. Everybody dies in this game. All right. So, whoop. I, when I use the forward button, sometimes it jumps games instead of pieces. All right, this game by from the challenger section by Amin Tabatabe and Thomas Beardson was a very peculiar slav. There's the first trade. Knights, pawns. All right, we're going to go a little bit longer. Here's another trade, knight for bishop. Now, queen a4, king d7. Black's king playing defense, but the position is still reasonable. Bishop a5, look at these laser beaming bishops. But still, black is actually okay. Um, now bishop for knight. Now rooks. All right, now bishops. 
20 moves into this game, it looks like two 700s who just have a fetish for exchanges. You know what I'm talking about. You guys, you, some of you just boot up chess games literally to hear the clicking noise. I mean, it's much more, it's much less bore, it's much more boring to hear that move than the crunching chess.com sound of a piece capture, you know? So it takes B4, and you know, throughout this game, it was Amin Tabatabe putting the pressure on black, but here, instead of just sitting there and, and just having his queen and rook on, Beardson says, no man, queen trade. That is a massive decision. Why? Because when you simplify down to queens and then to pawns, I mean, with this many pawns, you best be sure that you're going to not lose, okay? Now, in a king and pawn endgame, two things matter. Obviously, material, but that's like obvious. Four pawns will beat one. In equal material king and pawn endgames, the activity of the king and how effective your pawns can be. And in this case, the white king is going to go there and try to break through, because otherwise it's just a draw. Um... So, Beardson did not have to do that, and also White did not have to trade, like, I mean, could have played Rook C5 and, you know, tried to get this endgame, and, you know, this is just annoying for Black, but probably losing, uh, but maybe not. And in the game, what happened was they all traded, and, you know, that's exactly what I mean did. And here, uh, Thomas Beardson made a... It's probably not even Thomas, right? Because he's Dutch, so it's probably like Toma or something. Dutch folks, y'all got wild names. So essentially here, what Black had to do was just chill. Like literally. But by, by, by the way, don't tell people to just chill in the middle of an argument. Don't do that. But in a chess game, you can just chill. Like just wait. The guy's going to come forward. Just chill. Guy's going to come forward. Like just chill. The guy's going to come forward. You got to take it. Like, you, maybe you're losing, like, 25,000 moves into the future, but I don't know. But he, he plays F6, and when you make a pawn move like this, you are drastically weakening the position, potentially. Now H5, and now when you take, yes, your king gets back, but more often than not, when you are this passive in a king and pawn endgame, you're gonna lose. So Beardson had to not take. And the craziest thing is, if he went here, white still gets through, you know how? Pawn sack. Brutal. Take, and now the white king walks in. Like, the white king still infiltrates because he's so active. And there's no way in for black on the other side of the board. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Amin gets in, pushes his pawn, and I mean, black just runs out of moves in this game. It's actually kind of nuts. They get down to five pawns each. I told you this game is like the Hunger Games. Look at this. King h7, g6, black is hanging on for dear life. And white plays b3. One final pawn move. The only pawn move white had. Because if white goes here, takes. It's white's only remaining move that doesn't lose the game. Because you either move your king or your pawn and lose. The only move that doesn't lose the game. The only legal move you have that doesn't lose the game. b3. And black resigns because black now has no moves. If you take, I will take that. If you move your king, I will take this. This is called Zugzwang and uh, Beardson resigned. Crazy. I told you, it's like the Hunger Games this game. <laughs> I mean, what a game. And instructive, you know, and uh, definitely an instructive endgame. So don't just rush to trade everything. I mean, things can happen really, really late. Now, this next game is a totally different type of Hunger Game, and the game I'm gonna have after this is just complete pandemonium. It's two, two, uh, two teenagers having a fist fight in the playing hall. Literally, that's what happened. Yeah, they got up and started punching each other. So, uh, Velimir Ivic is having a fantastic tournament. Uh, Supi is having a good, a, an okay tournament before this game, um, but he's missed a few chances. He even said that in his interview. Uh, I mean, Ivic is crushing. I mean, he has like three wins and the rest of the games are draws. And this game begins with uh, a Nidorf, a very, very sharp Nidorf. And Supi plays h5, which prevents white from playing g4, and then plays knight bd7. Um, and knight bd7 is a relatively new move. It's what he said. And then he transfers his knight over here. And white completely clamps down on the queen side, like not letting black move. 
Then white does what you're supposed to do in the knight orf, which is to jump a knight into the center of the board on d5. And then plays c4. And I mean, visually from the opening, it looked like a totally desperate position for black. Okay? And by the way, for the uh, Portuguese-speaking audience, I know, I know your mans. Locomotiva. I know. I know. From the opening, it looked like Black's position was extremely desperate. I mean, it just looked like Black was trying, but nothing was working. I mean, White has a dominant positional advantage. And if he just moves the knight and gets the pawns going, it's over. Like, Black's just going to lose. Because Black cannot break through. There's nothing here. He's trying, right? Okay, Bishop d4 from Ivic. Now Bishop f1 back. We have a trade, and the knight comes back. And he just plays rook a3. Total dominance of the third rank. b4 is coming. And... What is Supi going to do here? Like, what? Okay, he just moves his rook, right? But that's the thing about chess. Like, you don't just get a good position and the game is over. You actually need to win. So Supi plays queen g4. Now Bla uh, white offers a queen trade. Supi's like, no queen trade. White plays knight back to c2. Reroutes the knight to e3 a few moves later. I mean, he's just like slowly improving his position. Looking for an opportunity to come in. Rook d1. And, I mean, a lot of shuffling occurs here. A lot of shuffling. All right, now we've made move 40. So the players have made their 40th move. And here's c5, finally. At move 40, they get extra. Rook c3, they get extra time. Rook c1. I mean, white is just on the verge. But Supi is defending very well. I mean, he's sitting there going, my position is bad. How are you going you know, to beat me? Rook b8. All right. Now, in this position, White had a winning idea, which is really disgusting. His winning idea was to play g4. So oftentimes, positions fall apart when they are overwhelmed. In this case, Black is overwhelmed on the queen side, kind of in the center. But once this happens, like, if you get overwhelmed on all three sides of the board, it's over. You just can't. And if you take, there is bishop h3, pinning, f5 is possible. But then there's even like c6, just, I mean, you're just blasting through the position. Okay? So, I don't know if you can hear, can you hear the hissing? Can you guys hear that? I'm pretty sure you can. Let me know in the comments. It's so loud in here. I think it's going to stop though. Anyway, instead of that, Ivic takes on d6. And Supi has to, like, look, look at the stuff Supi has to go through in this game. Rook c7. And finally, Ivich does in fact find this g4 idea, but now it's a little bit late. It's a little bit late because black gets a blockade. And yes, you can take my pawn on h3, but now Supi starts standing up to the bully. Lokomotiva has arrived. B6. All he needed was one move. And here comes counterplay. Make no mistake, his position is not very pleasant, but his piece has come alive. And after you have been oppressed for four to five hours in a chess game, you are going to stand up for yourself, all right? Queen b7, knight c7, the king is safe now. Knight goes back to eight, he's just looking for an opportunity. Again, the shuffling begins, rook takes b4. The idea from Ivic was to play queen c5, but black plays defense once again, soupy defensive masterclass. Bishop a6, can't take because white queen takes rook. Queen b8 back, bishop back. Rook b1, counterplay down the b file. Now, look at, look at the fact that Ivich has still been up a pawn the entire game. Take, take. Ch check on b2. Queen a1. Knight d1. If black loses one more pawn like this one, it's over. But he has the impregnable defense of the knights. These knights on d6 and e8, nobody can touch him. Nobody can touch him. Queen f6 back. And suddenly, right around here, Supi catches his opponent with knight h5 check. And if you take it, there's a fork. So you gotta go here, but all of a sudden, Supi's back. White plays bishop f1, and Supi plays queen e7, which defends the pawn and attacks h4. The engine here gives knight e4 anyway, and then forking the knights with the king. That's some bullshit. Like, I'm not even, if you, that is unfindable. You are not finding that in a million years, six hours into a chess game. So, Ivic plays g5. And on move 73, he made one bad move. Ivic played 72 good moves. 
He played one bad move on move 73. Supi went back with his knight, forward with his knight, forward with his queen, forward with his knight, forward with his queen, forward with his knight, and Ivic resigned because either he loses the queen or king e1, and that's mate. Long live the horses of Luis Paulo Supi. Locomotiva! Let's go! What a comeback. That's his first win of the tournament. And he gets a rest day. Now he gets to chill. Huge win for the Brazilian. Shout out to the Brazilian audience. Um, big win. I got nothing against Ivic, by the way. I just really, I was rooting for Supi. Ivic is really good. All right, now uh, it's time uh, for, the two for the two teenagers who actually didn't play a chess game at all and decided to punch each other in the face. Um, Gukesh D and Pragnananda Ramesh Babu. I don't know why his name on chess.com is just Pragnananda or like chess.com events. Like they just removed his other name. I'm pretty sure he's not like McLovin, you know, in Superbad. Like he doesn't just go by Pragnananda. Um, I think his full name should be there. But this is the way the game loaded in. Anyway, Gukesh D uh, and Pragnananda, they play a uh, symmetrical English. This was a very interesting line. And Gukesh has had enough of normal chess, so he plays rook g1. Now, you would imagine that the idea of rook g1 is to play the move g4. You would be right, sacrificing a pawn. Black actually has no choice. Uh, if black tries to avoid it, this, this wins the queen. So, be brave. Takes, takes... Knight d5, bishop c5, which attacks the pawn in f2, right? Now, any normal person here uh, realizes that, you know, you got to go rook g2. But apparently rook g2 is a bad move. We're going to see that later. Queen e2 is played. Apparently taking here is bad. You know why it's bad? Not because of king d1. Because of queen f2. <laughs> because you are pinned. So knight f6 wins your queen. Oh my god. So f5 now defends against that in the future. Knight back to f4. Rook g2 is apparently a blunder. So there is a line here. Rook g2 is a losing move. When I saw this, I was like, what? Rook g2 apparently is losing to pawn takes e4. Now, Gukesh was not going to take back. He was going to go here. All right. Then black would play queen f5. Apparently, that's the best move. Now white has rook g4, queen g4, queen c4, king h8, queen c5. And in this position, both guys missed rook f5. Or maybe they didn't miss it. I don't know. Maybe there's knight d5. Maybe there's more to this. But then there's h6, which traps the knight. But then there's queen d6. And then if h takes g5, there's bishop c3 with queen h6. Oh my god, maybe they're both just absolute. Oh, but there's Rook G. Ah. Ah. Yeah. That, like, the computer hated this, but it was because both guys needed to see 14 moves ahead. They didn't. So Gukesh went here, gave up the pawn, and castled. Now, opposite side castling usually means we're going to have a barn burner of a game. Like, it's going to be a scrap. Now... Prague had to go here and try to trade the queens off, or at least the knights. Instead, he goes back, and now Gukesh activates his bishop, and this just looks scary, right? I mean, it just looks like white's attack is right on the verge, all right? So knight f3, queen f3, bishop e6, and he just asks the question. Now, apparently, h3 is a bad move. Now, that's what I'm saying. This game was a fist fight, all right? Apparently, h3 is not the move. Like, apparently, you got to go here first. That's what the computer wants, but... Shut up. All right. H3 played. Now we have knight. Uh, we have bishop back to e5. But apparently bishop takes f4 first was better. Because you need to do this. Instead of that, black does it this way. And apparently this is a losing move. Because you have takes. 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 And white's just up a piece. Now... I guess Prague must have thought he was just losing no matter what happened here. Um, but not necessarily. And also... Uh, no, I think that's it. Maybe, was it here? No, no. That, yeah, that's basically it. I, I mean, I basically just bishop f4 had to be played. But like I said, this looks terrifying. The, 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 this, this, this bishop... <laughs> that was very embarrassing. Please uh, just forget that ever happened. Uh, 
this bishop and rook combo is really brutal. So uh, Gukesh just up a piece. Queen, rook, bishop. And uh, okay, he has to avoid like, you know, some attack. Uh, check. But the king is safe. King is safe. And uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it's never too late to blunder mate in one. But uh, not at this level. Check. Blocks. King runs a little bit. Uh, but the king is safe. And uh, yeah, it's actually black who has to need to worry about getting mated. And Gukesh has now won several games in recent days. Uh, he won against Parham. He won against Prague. This game was a, was a wild, wild game. Um, and uh, it's the last one of our recap. Magnus Carlsen has now won three out of four, guys. He has won three out of four. Now, uh, today, the 26th, is a rest day, so there are no games. The tournament will conclude on the 27th, 28th, and 29th uh, as we look to see what's going to happen. Is Magnus going to win all the rest of his games too and win the event? That'd be nuts. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.